Hello, Booktube, and welcome back to Reading in the Dark. Byron here. Um, so, this is an interesting video. This is sort of like a celebration for me. When I started this channel, Reading in the Dark, I called it Reading in the Dark partially because I hadn't read that much. When I started the channel, I said, what makes this channel different from all the other Booktube channels? And one of my, like, selling points, really, I guess, was that I'm not well read. Which was true, because when I was in high school, I didn't really read everything I was supposed to read, and I certainly didn't read for fun. I only read a couple of books here and there, and then when I was out of college and uh, living in New York and trying to make my career happen, I didn't really read then either. And then starting in 2008, I kind of started to read a little bit because of reading Tess Gerritsen books, thrillers, but even then I would go through phases where I would read two or three books and then I would stop reading. Two or three books, and then I would stop reading. And I realized, you know, this year that I really love reading and that that was really dumb and I needed to make a change. And that's why I started this channel because I wanted to use it as a way to motivate myself to keep reading and turn that around for myself. And I'm very, very happy to announce that it seems to have been a success. I have turned things around for myself because as you will know, if you follow my Instagram or my Goodreads, as of a couple of days ago, when I finally finished reading Bram Stoker's classic Gothic horror novel, Dracula, I have actually managed to meet my goal on Goodreads of 52 books in a year. I have read 52 books in 2018. So I'm very excited about that and I'm going to drink to myself in having accomplished the goal. You may drink with me. This is a lovely glass of um, Malbec, I believe, from 2016. There you go. <laughs> Considering the fact that I started reading in 2018, not until I think it was late February, and just finished the 52 books now in the first week of December, that means I'm actually kind of a month ahead of schedule. So what I thought I would do clink for this video just for fun to wrap my brain around the fact that I read 52 books this year I thought I would do something kind of fun and crazy of the spur of the moment I came up with this idea I thought wow 52 what did I read again so what I have done is well first pour a glass of wine secondly I have printed out a list of all 52 books and all it says is the title and who wrote it and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sit here and I am going to go down the list and see if I can remember enough to give you a very brief synopsis of each book that I read, almost like a wrap up, to see if I can retain enough information after 52 books to remember what all of these books were about. And I don't think I'm gonna fail this exactly, but we'll see, it's very interesting. I haven't really looked at the list, I have not cheated. I just printed it out and sat down and had some wine, which I'm gonna do again. And I was gonna see if I could do it in under two minutes, but I don't know, I'm just gonna do it as fast as I possibly can. And I can't wait to edit this video and put in 52 separate book cover graphics. It will be the best. So, ooh, I'm getting nervous. Starting in February, I'm gonna take a drink. All right, here we go. In 2018, I read Call After Midnight by Tess Gerritsen, which is a thriller, romantic thriller about a woman who uh, her husband is a spy, and the book starts with him in a hotel room uh, killing a guy and putting him in his clothes and setting the hotel on fire. Then I read The Ashes of Eden by William Shatner. This was an audio book. This is the first of a trilogy in the Odyssey trilogy by William Shatner, which brings Captain Kirk back from the dead, and it starts with Spock on the planet where he died. And it has something to do with Romulans and Klingons who made babies once, and it was a problem. Under the Knife by Tess Gerritsen. This is a really good one. This is another romantic suspense novel from a long time ago. This is a book in which uh, there was an old case of malpractice and there was a, there was a, I think because um, of maybe there was a, or something like that. And, oh, maybe that was a spoiler, but it's a really old book and it was really good and I really enjoyed it. And it was very simple and I enjoyed that book. The next book I read was The Return by William Shatner, also an audiobook. This is book two in the Odyssey trilogy. This is the one where the Romulans use the Borg technology to bring Kirk back to life, but they're gonna use him for the horrible purpose of killing Captain Picard. Then I listened to the third book in that trilogy, Avenger by William Shatner. I don't remember a lot about this one, but I do know that it still had to do with the woman who was from the world where people were half Romulan and half Klingon. Her name was Teilani, and he was supposed to help them, and it was a thing, and the books all kind of blended together. They were narrated very poorly by Tim Russ, and there was something about Wesley Crusher came back at one point magically and 
things ensued and Kirk uh, went back to live with her and stuff like that. And as somebody was like curing a disease. Okay, Mosaic by Jerry Taylor, Star Trek Voyager book that tells the origin story of Captain Catherine Janeway. It tells about when she was younger and how she met Hobbs Johnson, who's who we know as Mark on the show, and how she uh, got over the trauma of seeing the wreckage of the ship in which her fiance and her father were killed. Uh, Haven, Kansas by Alethea Contest is about a young girl whose family lives in a house where she finds a secret room behind her bed that has all these old things in it, including a book of like spells or something. And her good, good friend recently died. And oh gosh, um, her good friend recently died. It has something to do with witchcraft. And she looks into this book and it's all tied together and she tries to figure it out. And her younger brother gets involved. And they all end up under, there's all these birds and it's it's fun and spooky and <laughs> I need to read it again. And it was a long time ago. Oh my God, the next book I read was Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. I read this because I wanted to see the movie starring Natalie Portman, which was nothing like it. Um, this is also a story of a group of scientists that are set out on an expedition into a mysterious area on the coast of California that has been enveloped by a secure force field magically by some alien force we don't know how or why. And they always lie to all of the employees and the rest of the world about how long it's been there and what they're doing in there while they're in there. They can't use their names and people are being transformed and it's all very mysterious and scary and people lose their minds and go crazy and it's a really amazing book and it makes you feel like you're nuts. The second book I read right away after that, Authority by Jeff Vandermeer, deepens the story and tells the story from the perspective of the guy who's taking over command of the operation called the Southern Reach and his only goes by the name of Control because none of them have names and it's a whole thing and it deepens the whole mythos of everything. Then I listened to The Genesis Wave, book one, Star Trek The Next Generation. Oh, oh, I got things confused by John Vornholt. This is a terrible trilogy. This is about the Genesis device from Star Trek, Wrath of Khan, and how some people have figured out a way to weaponize it and use it to ter basically terraform worlds that already have life on it, and it kills everybody and turns the planet into a wholly, totally new place to make it hospitable for them. And this is the first book of that. Dr. Carol Marcus is in it, and... Um, ooh, the woman that Jordi LaForge was creepy with on the TV show is in it, and she uses this really cool, like, suit that keeps you safe because you go phasing in and out of the space-time continuum and things. And that's the first book. That's the one that's, that's narrated by Tim Russ. The other ones by William Shatner were narrated by William Shatner. Um, Acceptance by Jeff Vandermeer completes the trilogy of The Southern Reach by Jeff Vandermeer and is also crazy and brings everything together. This one is finally told in the third person, and it's multiple POV, and you just figure out everything, and it all goes together, and it's intense, and I gotta read them all again because they're just fascinating, which is why I bought them in an omnibus of all three books. Uh, the Turn of the Screw by Henry James. This is about a... Well, I am not doing this in under two minutes. This is about a... A young woman who goes to be a governess for a man who's very wealthy but is never at home and has two children and there are like ghosts lurking in the house or maybe there are not and maybe or maybe she's losing her mind because she's crazy and she's gone away from home for the first time and maybe it's all real and you can't really tell but there were some creepy people who used to work there and they're gone now and it's very trippy and you can't always be totally sure what's going on. She's an unreliable narrator and it's a really fascinating book but it's difficult to read but now that I've read it, it'll be easier the second time and I love it. Desperate Hours by David Mack. This is Star Trek The Discovery book. This is the first book and it tells the back backstory of um, David Burnham and it also pits her and Spock together and the first time they've seen each other since they were adolescents and they both left home from the home that they didn't exactly share together but they were raised by the same people and they have to figure out all of these little clues and things in order to desperate hours desperate hours desperate hours there's an alien ship that's rising up out of from underneath the ocean on this planet and um it's, it's powerful, and there's a Starfleet outpost there, and people are in danger, and Spock and Burnham have to figure it out. And Captain Giorgio and Captain Christopher Pike, they don't like each other, and there's a whole thing, but it doesn't matter because everything has to do with Spock and Burnham anyway. The Flicker of Old Dreams by Susan Henderson is an amazing and beautiful book that I first heard about on Writer's Bond Writing podcast, and it tells the story of a woman who lives in a town named Petroleum, which is sort of a ghost town that's slowly dying and everyone there is unemployed. Uh, after many, many years ago, a accident killed a young boy in like the grain mill or something that has an elevator that, you know, sending the grain onto the train. And so they closed it down and everybody lost their jobs. And she works there as a mortician in the uh, funeral home with her father, who's an alcoholic and her mother is gone. And she just takes care of her dad and does her job. And the kid who supposedly caused the accident a decade or two ago comes back into Petroleum petroleum for the first time. Everybody hates him because he destroyed the town, supposedly, to be there with his mother in her final days. And she gets to know this like guy who's like a social pariah and it's just beautifully written and it's wonderful. Star Trek Death Count by L.A. Graff. This is a story about the original crew of Star Trek, the Enterprise, 
and they are, whew, uh, it, ooh, it focuses on Ahura and Chekhov and Sulu, and Sulu buys something at the mall, basically, and craziness ensues, and somebody has secret technology, and they're being chased, and they might be on board the Enterprise, and danger. Okay, Star Trek The Lost Years by J.M. Dillard. This fills in the gaps between the end of the Star Trek original TV series and the first Star Trek film called Star Trek The Motion Picture. This book had, features a completely different version of the McCoy, McCoy character, who is an idiot and worthless and drunk all the time and depressed. Spock is going off to learn the colon R. If you don't know what that means, I'm sorry. Watch Star Trek some more. And um, it's not a very good book. I Know a Secret by Tess Gerritsen, a thriller. It has to do with a group of young people who are making a B horror film and how one of the people who was involved in making the book gets murdered in a way. And Jane Rizzoli and Maura Isles are gonna figure it out and they're on the case and it was a really fun read. And I had missed her and I was glad to read that book again. The Lathe of Heaven by Ursula K. Le Guin. This is a trippy, trippy, trippy short novel about a man who has dreams about things and the things that he dreams are true when he wakes up. Not all the time, but he has some special name for those dreams that he has, active dreams, powerful dreams, I don't know, something. And he goes to see a, psych a psychologist or therapist. The therapist realizes that he's actually telling the truth and starts to Um, the of heaven. And then, um, ooh, Ilsa by Madeline L'Engle. This is a beautiful book that tells the story of a young man who spends his entire life in this town in love with and raptured by, fascinated by, and obsessed with this woman named Ilsa, who goes blind partway through her life, and he just stays in the same town where he grew up his whole life, just basically following around and wishing that she would fall in love with him. And it's beautifully written, and it has nothing to do with kids saving the world and science fiction -y fantasy things that Langle is known for. So people don't like it, but I think it's just beautiful and wonderful, and I love it. The Glass Forest by Cynthia Swanson. This tells the story of a man and his wife who go to his dead brother's house, who has just passed away, um, to deal with his affairs after he has died, and the aftermath of the fact that the... The wife, his brother's wife, his sister-in-law, has disappeared, and what happened to the brother, and where is she, and did she murder him, et cetera, et cetera, and it's set in the 70s, and I really enjoyed it. Whistling Past the Graveyard by Susan Crandall. This tells the story of a young white girl in the South who runs away from home and is sort of rescued by a poor black woman who is in a horribly abusive relationship. And the two of them go on the run together, and it's a whole thing. And it's a, you know, it's like in the 50s, and it's like segregation and bad racial things, and it's it's tense and intense, and um, it's a lot. Yeah, and I enjoyed it, question mark? Um, the Other Side of Everything by Lauren Doyle Owens. This is a book, this is a thriller that tells the story of a person, woman, who was murdered, yes, woman. She was murdered, an older, an elderly woman who was murdered in her home where she lived for most of her life in a neighborhood full of lots of originals, they call themselves, these older people who all bought houses in this neighborhood at the same time, and they've all lived there for many decades, and they're all aging and getting older, and the investigation happens, but you're not following the police, you're following the sort of, um, suspicions of the other people who live in the town, especially this one older man, and they're trying to figure out what happened to her without it being an investigation exactly, but they all kind of band together and decide they shouldn't be alone because somebody is targeting all these older octogenarians in this town, and you learn a lot of the history between all these neighbors, and it's really fascinating and really beautiful, and I loved that book, and I think I like loved it more than I even realized I did when I first read it. And then I finished The Genesis Wave. I listened to books two and three. This is the Star Trek Next Generation, Next Generation story that has to do with the technology of the Genesis device from Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan, and it involves like every single character you could possibly imagine in Star Trek The Next Generation universe, and it is not well written, and it is not well narrated, and it is a waste of time. Eileen by Otessa Moshveg. Eileen by Otessa Moshveg is a book uh, written, it was Man Booker Prize uh, nominated, maybe shortlisted, but definitely longlisted, I think, and um, tells a story of a disaffected young woman who lives in a town by herself and has an alcoholic father and it's always freezing cold, and she works in a, a, a child's prison, a young boy's prison, and has strange hygiene habits, and she's funky, and she's weird, and she she meets this fabulous woman who like sounds like Grace Kelly walking in the front door, except she's a redhead, who works at the prison, and she becomes obsessed with her, and then something happens, and she has to help her, and it's a whole thing, but it's just like a character study, and she's fascinating. 
and it's just absurd and 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 perverted and, and so interesting and well written. The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. I wanted to reread this. So I actually listened to the audiobook narrated by Jeremy Irons because it is the greatest audiobook in the world. And this tells this is a fable about the world and following your dreams and things like that. And I actually found it to have a lot of misogynist elements this last time that I listened to it, which annoyed me that I hadn't realized were there before, but I really enjoyed it anyway. So it went from five stars to four stars, but it's fine. Um, My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Moshveg. This was a brand new book that I pre ordered and read the very day that it was released, the moment that it came on my Kindle. and. I enjoyed it. It's the story of a young woman who stays in her apartment and puts herself under the influence of lots of prescription drugs for the better part of a year because, or for a year because she wants to take an entire year to just sleep and unplug from the world to separate herself from these really unhealthy um, things that she has going on in her life. And it's really interesting and it's a commentary on the sort of apathy and disaffected nature of young people in the world today and the way she allows, her, allows herself to be treated. It's a fascinating book. It's really beautiful and it has a shockingly beautiful ending. Fire from Heaven, Fire from Heaven by Mary Renault. Fire from Heaven is the first book of three in a trilogy about of historical fiction about Alexander the Great, and it explores a lot of the relationship between Alexander and Hephaestion. Okay, Star Trek Prime Directive by Judith and Garfield Reeves Stevens is a book that tells the story of this uh, event in Star Trek life where Kirk and his entire crew are taken off of their assignment of the Enterprise because Kirk makes the wrong decision in trying to help this alien species when he's not supposed to interfere and something happens with the warp drive and the ship is like completely destroyed in a way that no one has ever seen before and it's very, very scary and weird and scientifically fascinating. And you follow them as they're separated and they're not on the Enterprise anymore and then they come together to investigate and prove that he was innocent and he didn't do anything wrong and it's really interesting and it has to do with advanced cultures and how they make contact with less advanced cultures and it had a lot to say about our own world and I thought it was one of the only Star Trek books that I ever read that really had a purpose and like a drive that was relevant to our world and was like the height of what science fiction can do and I was really impressed by it and I loved it and it's my favorite Star Trek book of all time and so I bought another copy of it on hardcover. Elsa Lanchester herself is the autobiography of the woman who played the Bride of Frankenstein in The Bride of Frankenstein, who also was in like a million other things in Hollywood. She played Katie Nana in the movie of Mary Poppins. She was in That Darn Cat with Haley Mills on the Disney Channel, just lots of random things. She did a lot of stuff on stage and she began her career in England as a sort of cabaret songstress person. Um, her life was fascinating, and as an actor, I had an amazing time reading all of her stories and anecdotes. She knew everybody. She did everything. She was married to Charles Lawton, and it's a very intimate portrayal of his life and his uh, homosexuality and how he dealt with it or didn't, and how she loved him and stayed with him anyway. Loved it. The Hunger Games by Susan Collins, which I read for Booktubeathon, was a quick read. Uh, it was a lot better than I expected it to be. It was fascinating, and it was actually had a really powerful female character, and not just because she did amazing things and was strong and tough, but just like emotionally, I thought she was a badass, and I was really impressed by that book. Mildred Pierce by James M. Cain was one of my favorite reads of the year. It's a classic. It's about the relationship between a mother and daughter. The mother is extraordinarily ambitious, and then the daughter becomes resentful and becomes a famous singer, and she's manipulative and horrible, And but so is the mother, but not in the same level of horribleness, and it's just a fascinating character study, and it's set in the 50s, and I loved it. Or maybe it's the 40s. I don't remember. Yeah. Nixia by Scott Rinchen is a really fun read, but it's basically a ripoff of Ender's Game. And if you don't know what that means, well, read Ender's Game because it's a better version of the same story. A bunch of young people are recruited to be part of a very important mission in space. And it turns into a game, they sort of, so that they'll compete against each other. And it's like a whole thing. Nixia. Read Ender's Game instead. The Mirror by Marlis Milheiser is a historical fiction about a woman who on her wedding day, she looks into this old uh, antique mirror and is transferred into the body of her grandmother like a hundred years before on the day of her wedding to a man that she wasn't sure she loved because they're both having the same situation and they get switched and the grandmother lives in her and she ends up living in her grandmother's body her entire life and it's sort of like cyclical and weird and it's good for the first half but the second half is where the woman from like the 19 early 1900s is moved into the 70s and or late 1800s is moved in the 70s and then she's depressed and horrified and it kind of makes you feel like the modern world is a terrible place and it was much more depressing than the first half and i didn't like that part so i liked it halfway pathways by jerry taylor it tells the backstory of all the main characters of star trek voyager written by one of the people who created the show and i really enjoyed several of the stories in it and what was neat about it is that it was written by the one of the producers of star trek voyager and it's a star trek novel but it's basically an anthology of short stories and and that's very unique and unusual, and I loved it. A Separate Piece by John Knowles is my favorite book from growing up. I reread it, and I decided to reread it in this exact moment because it would have been my 100th book I ever read in my life. 
I loved it again. I cried again. I will say that the ending feels a little bit more abrupt than it did the first time that I read it. And that might be because I wasn't as emotionally invested because I had to take more breaks while reading it this time. But I really still absolutely love a separate piece. It puts me in this like mental place that is just like, uh, a lot. So a separate piece. John Knowles. Still love it. It's still five stars. It's a beautiful book. A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms by George R. R. Martin. This is a prequel to uh, the Game of Thrones uh, series, uh, Song of Ice and Fire, which was set 100 years before A Game of Thrones and tells the story of this uh, hedge knight um, named Sir Duncan the Tall and his squire named Egg, who is with him and all of their adventures and things. And you learn little tidbits of like the world outside of their small little corner of it. And a little bit about how like the world is going on right now, a hundred years before Game of Thrones. And it's fascinating because I love Game of Thrones and I haven't read any of their books, but I really enjoyed this one. And it made me want to read more of his stuff. And it's beautifully illustrated and I have it on hardcover and I just lent it to a friend and it's a great book. Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Frankenstein is obviously the story of Dr. Frankenstein who figures out this amazing thing that he can do and then as soon as he does it in the laboratory, it works and he is instantly horrified and he thinks, wait, what in the hell have I been doing? This was a terrible idea. This is an abomination, an aberration unto the Lord, etc., etc., etc. And it sort of has this really troubling um, concept behind it about how science and, and discovery and all of this might actually not be the right thing and that the holy thing is to just accept the world the way it is and not try to change everything all the time because science is evil. And that's not actually something that has come out and like actually said by Mary Shelley in the book, but that's kind of the vibe that I got and it was sort of annoying and uh, preachy. But I enjoyed the book, it was fine. I just really hated the section where the monster told his story within a story for like 17 years. All Systems Read by Martha Wells. All Systems Red is a novella, and it's the first in the trilogy um, in the Murderbot Diaries about a automated robot that is designed to protect the members of this uh, crew on this station on this moon somewhere that are like mining something or whatever. And then some stuff is going down at one of the other locations for the same company on the same moon and they can't get a hold of them and they think something might be wrong and they want to go find them. And then they realize that like stuff did go down and people are dead and he's trying to protect them. And then he, this robot, he, she, it doesn't have a gender is very, very uncomfortable around people and is designed to just be a robot and by himself and spends all of his time um, digesting all of the like the media that's in the library of like his like gigantic iTunes library of like TV shows and movies from like thousands of years of human history and doesn't want to talk to people but is forced to and has to come out of his shell and deal with it. And it's a very interesting commentary on sort of introverted people and how they relate to others and freedom and the nature of that and what that all means. And it's a beautifully written book and it's so short and it's deceptively just a silly little sci-fi book that is actually really meaningful and I loved it. And I got to read the rest of that trilogy. Still House Lake by Rachel Kane, mediocre thriller about a mother who is on the run from people who want to kill her because they believe that she was complicit in her crazy serial killer's career of murdering people when in fact she really didn't have anything to do with it, but it's hard to believe that she didn't know that he was murdering people in their garage for many, many years because let's be honest, it is kind of hard to believe. And she's on the run and she and her kids have to keep on moving and then someone's found her and it's all dangerous and scary and all major cliche. Gravity by Tess Gerritsen was a reread for me. This is a story about a virus that is new that um, breaks out on the International Space Station and it affects all the people on the crew and the doctor has to figure out what to do and how to stay alive and how to like treat herself and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, and it also has an intersection with the idea of like the commercial space flight world and the astronaut who hitches a ride with like basically a SpaceX like rinky dink little shuttle thing to like save her. It's fascinating. Great book. So well researched. It's really re great. You should read it. You should read more Tess Gerritsen. Then I read The Woman in the Window by A.J. Finn, which is rear window with a woman and she's agoraphobic and having a broken leg. I mean, instead of having a broken leg. And that's it. Hannah Green and Her Unfeasibly Mundane Existence by Michael Marshall Smith is the story of a girl who finds out that her grandmother has been working with as the partner of the devil his entire life. And the devil needs his help because when people do evil things now in the name of the devil, somehow the energy is not going to the devil anymore. And so he's getting very, very weak and he needs her grandfather's help. And so she's there and they have all these adventures and they go to hell and stuff like that. And it's just crazy. And it's really, really whimsically written and I enjoy it. But then the sections in hell kind of like go on for too long and it gets a little confusing and dark and weird. So there's a whole thing with a roller coaster that is just like convoluted and takes too long. But it's a really fun and very, very cute book, but I wish that somebody would like cut it down. Blindness by Jose Saramago. 
is the story of a world in which there is an epidemic of blindness sweeping the world where you go blind, but instead of everything being dark, everything is just like bright white and you can't see anything because all you see is whiteness everywhere. And I don't know if that's like a racial commentary, but in any case, all these people are getting blind and they're put together in this little ghetto in this building. And it's just like the depravity and disgusting crap that happens inside there when they're abandoned by the government. And there's like no electricity and the plumbing is all messed up and there's poop everywhere. And it's just like a whole disgusting, like, post-apocalyptic, we've seen this before, look at how terrible things can be when the world goes to crap. And it was fine and then it wasn't fine anymore and I ended up kind of hating it. But it's like a book you're supposed to love because it's a masterpiece, et cetera, et cetera. So, okay. The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, I read because of the Netflix adaptation that was coming out and it was spooky and it was really, really great and it was a haunted house story and it was moody and atmospheric and it was a page turner, but what I really loved with the first section where the main character, Eleanor, is experiencing her freedom for the first time and goes off in her car and drives to Hill House and is just like looking around and fascinated by everything that she sees. I love The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. Scary stories to tell in the dark. I'm gonna say one, two, and three, all three books. I grew up reading these stories. They're illustrated by Stephen Gemmell. The illustrations are creepy. There's Harold, there's Clickety Clink. There's lots of really great stories and it's just like called from folklore and whatnot. And I read all three of these in between the other big books that I wrote for Spookathon, which were The Haunting of Hill House, and then Heartbreaker by Claudia Day, which is a story about a community of people who live uh, offset from the rest of society in what you might call a cult. They call it the settlement. And this woman, older woman, is the only outsider because like 10 years ago or something like that, she like crashed her car in there drunk and then she stayed and then she married somebody and then she had a daughter and now she has disappeared and they're trying to figure out where she went and why. And you learn about her from the perspective of three different people, including her dog, but you never hear about herself from her, which is really fascinating and it's a character study. And it's really just like spooky and weird. It's not spooky, but it's like, it's very, it's odd and kooky and strange and beautiful. It's just beautiful and it reminded me of Otessa Moshweg a little bit and it was a great book. Um, Slade House by David Mitchell. Slade House by David Mitchell is basically a ghost story about this impossibly huge on the inside but seemingly normal sized on the outside mansion in the, like the middle of London and people every nine years that, go dis that disappear when they show up there to do work on something or go inside to visit someone or whatever, to interview somebody or whatever. And then there's this like paranormal society that wants to investigate it and you learn about the history of this uh, kooky, this kooky, this these spooky brother and sister who've been living in the house for a very, very long time and maybe they're ghosts and people go disappearing there every nine years and it's basically a ghost story and it's uh, written by David Mitchell who wrote The Bone Clocks, which I just purchased and I will read soon. And I enjoyed it and it was fine. But it um, wasn't my absolute favorite and I didn't like the ending. Uh, okay then, Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad was just like a, like a journey into the darkest part of the human soul and about uh, just the white people up and down the Congo River mining for ivory and how they thought about all of the like um, less technologically advanced brown skinned people who live there and the way they take advantage of them and how somehow this one guy who works for the same company, this white guy ends up being worshiped by them because of course they're ignorant and savage. Um, and there are things about this that are really, really repulsive and, and wrong, but at the same time are meant to be so. And it, it takes you into a very dark place and it's hard to get through. It's a very difficult read, but I think it's a really interesting book and I enjoyed reading it for the most part and my thoughts on it are complicated and I have to read it again because there are parts of this book that I just didn't understand, but I liked it. And then I finally finished reading for the second time in my life, Dracula by Bram Stoker, which is a story of a guy who's a lawyer in London who is helping to facilitate the sale of property to this count from uh, Transylvania, whose name is Dracula. And um, he doesn't let him leave. And then he's scared that he's never gonna get out. And he sees him climbing down the side of his own mansion, like forward, like a lizard, and it's crazy. And then there's people who are losing blood and they're like, getting really pale and people have to figure out what's going on. The book is told through an epistolary format. So it's all letters and journal entries. It is Gothic. It is long. It is so fascinating. And one of my favorite books of all time. I loved it. And that was book number 52 of 52 in 2018. Fifty-two books. If you watch this entire video, I owe you a drink. Thanks for watching. I hope you all are having wonderful success with your own reading challenges this year. 
and that if you ever decide to make a video in which you try to very quickly describe over 50 books in one video, someone who loves you will intervene and say no. If you enjoyed this video, first of all, thank you. I don't know what's wrong with you, but thanks. And if you did, then you should hit the like button because that would be awesome. And if you loved it and would like to see more content like this in the future, hit the subscribe button. I am currently at 47 subscribers, which is pretty awesome. And my goal was to hit 50 before the end of the year. And that seems maybe possible. So, you know, subscribe, tell your friends, that would be cool. My videos are not normally anywhere near this long, but I just decided this was a good idea and I did it. And I don't think I'll ever do it again, but it happened. Oh my God, I'm gonna have so much editing to do. Pray for me. So I will see you all in the next video. And until the next time, I will be here in the dark reading. Bye guys.